Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to the Weekend Wellness Hour show. Very excited to have a colleague on today who I've been part of this think tank in Arizona for several years and Amy Vanderlinden is part of that and she owns a business in Arizona where she helps people with pelvic issues. So thank you so much for joining us today, Amy. It's a pleasure to have you. It's so great to talk to you. It's been a while and I'm really um, excited to be on today. Grateful to have the opportunity to share some things. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. So you are a physical therapist, but how did you get into this world of pelvic health? It's, it's kind of a more of a niche area and it's very unique. Well, my journey was definitely a bit more circuitous than some. Um, I've been a pelvic or I've been a physical therapist for quite a while. And in 2009, I had my kids in 05 and 08. And then in early 2009, I went up to take a course with John Barnes in myofascial release. And it really started there. From there, I ended up starting my own practice, just myself, and growing in kind of all of the fascial things. And he has a women's health course that's much more extensive. And so I ended up taking that just as... I'd had my own kids, a lot more of my friends were having kids and just sort of that need uh, really opening my eyes to how underserved that situation was. And so it grew from there. I started specializing in that, took some other courses. Um, we also treat men. And so taking some advanced courses with that as well, just um, we still focus primarily on women in the space, um, but when men need a pelvic PT, they're really up a creek because say, for example, 40 PTs in Phoenix do pelvic health, maybe 10 of them treat men. So they don't need us as much, but when they do, they're, they can really be um, in a pickle, sort of a bad phrase, but I'm constantly picking awkward words because of the work I do. So um, yeah, that's definitely, it's been that route of just really feeling like the need was what prompted me to pursue that specialty in this particular niche. Okay. That's great. So when you talk about pelvic health, what are all the areas are you, that you're addressing? So someone comes in, they're saying they were referred to see you. What are kind of some of the possibilities, the areas, the conditions, those types of things? I would definitely say the three main things that we treat most often are painful sex, okay. leaking urine, um, and then pregnancy related, whether it's pain during pregnancy or specific like pubic symphysis, diastasis is that splitting of the abdominal muscles mm -hmm. um, that can be very concerning. And probably a close fourth would be prolapse and that there's several different types and it's basically there's bulging of tissue vaginally that, you know, is definitely not how it should be and can get very concerning for women because a lot of the solutions they're presented with are related to surgery and that gets scary in a heartbeat. So, yeah. Yeah. So when someone comes in, let's just say, let's say they're having pain. Does the assessment involve muscles, joints, and tissues all around the pelvic area as well as a, somewhat above it, or is it kind of centered in that area? What are you looking at? So I definitely think this is a piece a little bit unique to us in that because we, and especially me and then the staff I've added, started in the myofascial world before the pelvic world and your fascia is just all your connective tissue. And so when we're looking at, you know, patterns and tension and why something might be torqued or pulled on or painful, our bones sit in the fascial system, our muscles are literally wrapped in bundles of fascia, our organs are, the nerves and blood vessels have to sit in there. And so we're basically a giant blob of wires, tubes, and hoses. And so um, I really was fascinated with the fascia and how that impacts all of those tubes and hoses and wires and blocks, so to speak. Um, and so we look at the whole body with every client, regardless of what brought them through the doors. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking for those lines of tension and then of course we have that advanced expertise in internal vaginal and rectal work, which is, well, I'm sure, we'll, I'm sure we'll dive into this because it's probably one of my favorite soapboxes mm -hmm. slash rants, but not all pelvic PT is created equal. And it's 
The only reason I even point that out is because there's already, I always joke, my biggest marketing problem isn't, oh, I'm better than so-and-so down the street or come here because of this. It's that no one knows that there are these types of solutions for those problems. Nobody knows, most people don't know that pelvic physical therapy is even a branch of physical therapy. Mm -hmm. They don't know there's physical therapy for pregnancy and pelvic issues or for sexual related issues for males nor females. Mm -hmm. So that education piece is like, the only reason I make the distinction again is because if someone thinks they've experienced pelvic PT, but maybe they never had any internal work done. Yeah that's happened, right? Mm -hmm. Or they have very specific things going on that would absolutely warrant rectal tissue being checked. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. And it's like, okay, well, you had incomplete care. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that pelvic PT is spreading and getting a lot more awareness and that so many women are coming out of school wanting mm -hmm. to specialize in it and grow in that. It's awesome. And we all have to start somewhere, right? You can't just launch yourself to expert status. But I do want people to know that those all are variations, you know, where to be really thorough, you know, you have to include all of those aspects of our anatomy. Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine that's probably a sensitive topic. And when people come to work with you, are they aware there, there are some internal checks for their public. Yeah, agents. that's definitely a conversation that we're having. Um, it's definitely in all of our educational material on our website and YouTube and all those things. Yeah. It's also part of those initial phone calls. And then we do something called a discovery session, which is basically, again, because people have no idea what pelvic physical therapy even is or mm -hmm. who it helps, how it helps. And even if it's on their radar, maybe some of their friends have talked about it, or they finally have heard of it in the birth world, and they know they need it, they still don't know what's going to happen when they get here. And that's just a really terrible position to be in when you're making decisions about your health, your time, your money, and like you said, sensitive nature on a lot of levels. And so one thing I really appreciate about our foundation in the myofascial world is that our main teacher, John Barnes, Mm -hmm. starts with being trauma informed from the very first class, yeah. not even related at all to the pelvis. Mm -hmm. from the very first class for treating any body part, he started training us on fight, flight, and freeze and how trauma is trapped in the body and mm -hmm. recommending books like Peter Levine and Body Keeps the Score mm -hmm. and things like that, where you understand we can't keep separating out mind, body, spirit. We are a whole person and you can't just do the shoulder or the hip or the ankle um, and expect to truly feel well and whole. And so, yeah, we're really, really big on education. And yeah, it's always, I'm also, my number one rant is by far informed consent. Yeah. And so every session, how do you feel about doing internal work today? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about vaginal work? We talk about rectal work, like it's always, just because we did it the last three sessions has nothing to do with today. Yeah. So I think that's really important. Um, and, and the philosophy around fascial work too is very much governed by your subconscious. So if someone doesn't feel safe, and obviously I can only control so many pieces of whether or not someone feels safe. Some people don't aren't safe in their own bodies, but to the best extent of our ability to create an environment that they feel safe in is hundred percent my responsibility and um where we start before we get in before I touch their neck before I touch their hand um but yeah so we do treat whole body and we we definitely that's a delicate subject and part of why it's so needed mm -hmm. absolutely and just having that rapport and someone knowing exactly what to expect that helps bridge that gap between you know for trust so especially in a very sensitive area like this. Now, when you're dealing with some of these common, let's go into pregnancy. So when someone, when a woman is pregnant, you hear a lot about the ligaments become a little bit more lax or loose. There's changes around the body to allow for delivery. You're also often hear that, oh, things will go back to normal afterwards. <laughs> and 
obviously you see women well after they've given birth. So what are you seeing as kind of reality in terms of the pelvis as they're going through pregnancy and then afterwards? Yeah, that's definitely been a huge bulk of our client base over the last couple of years as pregnancy and postpartum. And we do have that hormone relaxant that goes through the body and lets things kind of open and allows for the growth of the baby in a woman's body, which is still so extraordinary to me. Um, and then I think there's such a range of experience for women in pregnancy and delivery and postpartum. And so we're, we try to be very intentional when we use the word common versus normal, yeah. because common, it's common to pee during end stage of pregnancy. It's common to have diastasis or pubic symphysis, the bones in front of your pelvis where your pubic bone is, mm -hmm. it's common for that to get stretched and create some pain. Um, it doesn't mean it's normal and it doesn't mean it's not treatable. So again, we try to be very careful with those words across that range of possibilities because some women have very little pain throughout the course of their pregnancy, um, especially first time pregnancies. Even um, we work with some athletes and, and runners and CrossFitters and stuff, and they are very much thrown off when it feels like their bodies, which are so fit and healthy and strong, it feels like their bodies sometimes betray them in that sometimes they get the worst diastasis, but to, again, because those tissues aren't pliable and mobile and adaptable. So we work on that when women come in with something going on during pregnancy, or they've just heard about the fact that there is help for that. Uh, we try to really work on all of those pieces, distributing that symmetry and tension throughout the body. We are asymmetric beings. We all are at all stages of life. And so, but just trying to really give them as much mobility. You know, we don't want all the pressure going downwards towards the pelvis and yanking on the ribs. And we don't want laxity or weakness in the ribs pulling on the pelvis. And so we just really try to help balance out that tissue tension, give them appropriate strengthening. Women are told so many do's and don'ts, uh, especially don'ts during pregnancy related to exercise and movement. And then also for postpartum recovery and diastasis. And again, I'm so grateful that it's gotten on the broader pelvic, uh, not pelvic, public's awareness of diastasis and core, core and pelvic floor. You hear a lot of that sometimes for postpartum recovery. But anytime someone's trying to create a program, of course they have to stick with generalities. And so that doesn't always work for everybody. And so we try to really help women feel confident in what's going on with their body so they know what they need. And it just removes so much doubt and so much fear and that mental load that most women carry. We really try to alleviate that and help them know what their body needs so that they have a lot less discomfort throughout the rest of the pregnancy and a more confident starting point for their recovery. Mm -hmm. And how quickly after delivery, and I know this depends on the person, but how quickly can someone get started at looking at recovery? Let's say they have a vaginal birth and there wasn't any complications. Are they starting immediately two months down the road, just in general terms? Are you talking about with our care or are you talking about for like getting back to activities? Um, for your care. <clears throat> so let's say they've been seeing you and usually when someone's getting care and they're doing well with you, they want to return back just to make sure they're on the right path. Yeah. So that's a very common scenario. Mm -hmm. And we've seen them the day they left the birth center because of pain oh. in the sacrum that was like preventing them from standing. That's not a super mm -hmm. common. Thank goodness. Okay. Um, but we typically stick with around that five to six week guideline also, especially mm -hmm. if they had any stitches or, or um, are still feeling tender or healing up or they're still bleeding, they don't really want to come in. And that can last anywhere from three to six weeks okay. also. So we do stick with kind of that general six week guideline, but if they're having an issue and we don't definitely don't do any internal before six mm -hmm. weeks, just body just needs to heal. Yeah. And we really try to encourage them to just get to know their body, get to know their baby, yeah. sleep, eat, yeah. <laughs> you know, and just really not put any pressure on themselves for those first couple of weeks to do something. 
We also work with babies. And so a lot of times I'll see moms, I'll physically see them, not treat them, yeah. but I'll see them because they bring their babies in for lip and tongue tie. And we also just oh, okay. do free screenings on our infants. When we've been working with mom during pregnancy, we just do kind of a free screening. Mm -hmm. uh, birth is a lot for them too. And just kind of unkink their necks and give them the opportunity to unwind and uh, get a little bit more acquainted with the outside world. Um, so that's really fun too. So sometimes I get to at least see the little babies and see mom, but we usually save treatment for around that six week mark. Okay. Oh, that's wonderful. And it's great that they have you as a resource too, as they're going through all this. So yeah. can you touched on this word pelvic floor. Can you describe what that means a little bit for those who are not familiar? You may have heard of it before. Yeah, of course. I don't know. So we literally, and I mean, it was staggering to me, the extent of anatomy we studied in grad school and did not discuss this. There wasn't so much as a, as we passed from the spine to the legs, there wasn't so much as a casual mention. Granted, I went to school a bit ago. It's getting much better, but not so much as a casual mention of like, oh, you have three layers of muscle in your pelvic floor, two for men, three for women. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in that aspect of the field, maybe look into that. Not even a casual mention, right? So women have three layers of muscle. The first two are a little bit more, they're not external, but they're, they're more the vaginal canal and the muscles in the actual canal. And then that layer three is the deeper layer. Um, you know, our pelvic floor has a supportive function for our actual organs. It has a sexual function. It also has that kind of sump pump with the breathing and our diaphragm of the mm -hmm. supportive structure of all of our organs in the body. It's kind of a big deal. And of course, the structural aspect of hips and spine and the connection of the pelvis, that's literally the center point between our top half and our bottom half. Yeah. Um, and so just kind of looking at all of those pieces and helping women to understand their own bodies too, um, that kind of the significance of education in our because it's such a passion of mine that women would understand that a majority of females orgasm with clitoral stimulation only. So sorry for the glitches, guys. I'm having some tech issues on my hand. I on my end, I think we have it handled now. So what a great spot to drop, right? Oh my gosh. So I was talking about how the pelvis has supportive function, sexual function, some pump, all of those pieces. And we definitely try to help women understand their bodies more, their cycle, all these different pieces. And that most women do not orgasm from penetration. That um, when our cells divide as embryos and determine whether or not we become male or female, that the same cells that are the um, stimulating orgasm piece of the tip of the penis are the clitoris. So when we grow up as little kids, it's not girls have a vagina and boys have a penis. It's boys have a penis and girls have a clitoris. Um, the va vagina literally structurally developmentally has completely different functions that aren't sexual. So that is take that for what that's worth. But um, that's a really when we deal with painful sex and we deal with postpartum recovery and all of these things, we can't really skip that because that is not the reality that most of us grew up believing, knowing about, expecting, and it impacts our lives big time and our health big time. Yeah. And I mean, that's everyone, you know, you're having romantic interest, what's part of reproducing. So it's definitely an important aspect. So when someone comes to you and they're having pain, when they're having sex, are you discussing these topics and are you showing different positions to help them relax so that it's not painful? Like, is that part of the process? A hundred percent. And just, you know, kind of backing up a few steps to the autonomic piece or the trauma piece. When you think about some basic statistics around infertility, miscarriage, abortion, rape, molestation, other sexual trauma, and then birth trauma, the chance that a female is walking in here without some degree, I mean, never mind add health issues like painful periods, 
um, painful sex, like all of those things, when we have pain, our brain says no. When we have trauma, our brain says no. And that extent to which our body will shift, adapt, or shut down to some degree is very prevalent. And so even aside from sexual trauma and sexual pain, we often are doing work to kind of downshift that nervous system out of fight or flight, out of freeze and regulating better. And then when you add sort of painful sex pieces on it, for sure, breathing, um, a lot of women are misled too about the whole pelvic floor and just do your Kegels. And yeah. I'm sure a man must have started that rumor because um, any woman would know that that can make a lot of pelvic tightness worse, it can make a lot of symptoms worse. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times even, so we leak, right? Or we've had babies and we just feel like everything is flabby and stretched out and sagging. But in reality, the body's amazing and it's trying to compensate and shift and help out. And so um, I literally, in all the years, excuse me, of doing pelvic mm-hmm. health, have not ever once worked on a woman where everything was literally just stretched out and weak. Mm-hmm. And so there's areas that are tight, that are guarding, that are trying to help out. And we have to address that first for the muscles to even work right. So we do a lot of reverse Kegel training and a lot of sort of belief shifting around what pelvic floor strength is and needs to be and looks like and feels like. Yeah. And this is prevalent in many areas of health. If you have pain, they say go strengthen that area and everything around. And it's like, that's often doesn't solve the problem because it just keeps you in a bad position that contributes to your pain and it's not really looking at you individually. So I can understand that and related kind of to the pelvic floor area and stretching and all that. Can you tell us a little bit more about prolapse? So yeah, prolapse is definitely where excessive pressure or tissue trauma causes some tissues to give way or be overly stretched out. Mm -hmm. And then things aren't where they were supposed to aren't aren't where they originally were, aren't where they supposed to be. And now you can have what's called vaginal prolapse where literally the walls of the vagina kind of are sagging and collapse in a bit. Mm -hmm. Vaginal vault prolapse is similar, just slightly higher up, but where the tissues are kind of, so like a woman will be concerned because she can either feel some tissue when she's wiping or like she'll look and it looks like there's a blockage or something there. And then, you know, then mass panic ensues, right? Because it's like, well, what's falling out of me? Um, There can also be bladder prolapse where the bladder is not supposed to be and is dropping down. And it, at its worst, it could potentially, not as likely because it has its own little anatomical pouch. A lot of damage would have to be done for your bladder to literally be falling out, but it can be partially prolapse. There's grades, of course, of severity. Mm -hmm. And then uterine prolapse, And that's, of course, the first thing women think of when anything's bulging. They're like, my uterus is falling out. Um, It can, that, you know, Mm -hmm. grade four uterine prolapse is a thing. And um, there are times where it does warrant surgery, but a lot of times it's a combo where Mm -hmm. you have three structures that are all a little bit off where they should be or a little bit weak or a little bit distended. And that's improvable. If one was truly, like if your uterus was literally you know, at the opening or protruding outside your body, the chance of that healing or strengthening on its own without any kind of surgery is pretty slim. Um, But we see a lot of grade ones and grade twos and even into grade three. The fourth one I don't want to forget is rectal prolapse. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, most people think of rectal tissue protruding out the anus. That's extremely rare because of the anal sphincter. Mm -hmm. That is not um, what I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about more, um, I'm talking more about the aspects related to, um, bulging of the rectal tissue in the vaginal canal where, uh, women might have to splint to poop, um, or different things like that. Um, so those are kind of some of the common types of prolapse. Most of them are treatable, uh, without surgery. Um, or other more significant interventions. 
Um, so yeah, we try to work with those different scenarios. Yeah, you often hear about women who've had some kind of surgery, put, have a mesh put in to support them. Is it becoming more common to see people before they go that route? Is, are you, is your world becoming a little bit more, you know, knowledgeable I to think doctors? So. Okay. I think so. I mean, we, we try to partner with a lot of OBs and mm -hmm. urogynecologists are often more the specialist, especially when there's mm -hmm. bladder involvement. Uh, we try to have good relationships, especially those here in the West and Central Valley of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. um, we talk to a lot of midwives and doulas that okay. then work with women during delivery. Um, so we're, we're, that's definitely something we try to educate about a lot. Um, because even surgeons, I mean, surgery is what they do, right? They don't necessarily mm -hmm. want it, you to be like, oh, no one needs surgery, right? Yeah. So not that that's so fine. much, as, but they don't want you know, people to suffer needlessly either. They're trying to use their expertise. So it also helps for us to have an understanding of options, right? It's like, well, doesn't necessarily need to be this massive cut you open mesh sling. It's like, they might be able to just do a few stitches to help lift, or there's things called urethral slings. So just like we want them to understand the work we do and the value we might be able to contribute. We're trying to observe surgeries or understand mm -hmm. the options they provide to clients and have a bit more of a collaborative relationship with that. So I think so, but of course, women that don't set foot in here don't necessarily ever get on my radar. So yeah. I'm, I'm not sure the numbers of people um, in terms of women getting. The yeah. other disturbing surgical piece is sometimes women will just get a hysterectomy. They're like, I'm done having kids. My uterus isn't where it's supposed to be. I'm not going to get a mesh sling. I'm just going to get a hysterectomy. I don't want my period anymore anyway. And not really understanding mm -hmm. the problems they might be facing soon or down the road in terms of, you know, our, our organs inside stack. So you have your bladder, the uterus mm -hmm. and the rectal tissue then up into the intestines and the abdominal cavity and they stack. And when you disrupt that stack, um, gravity's gnarly and not kinder the older we get and the mm -hmm. impact of the bladder and the potential for scar tissue and pain in the hips and pain with sex. I've worked with several post hysterectomy clients that they have, instead of like pain on entry, it's the, where the scar is from the removal, um, penetration hits that and it's very painful and we have to treat that scar tissue. And luckily that piece of it's treatable, but mm -hmm. in an ideal world, would probably have been best to not have their uterus removed. Yeah. yeah. Then and no one knows hard. those implications. And it seems like, I mean, that seems like a no brainer, right? Like you're done yeah. having kids. Why well, still have a cycle? Mm -hmm. Maybe if you're old enough, most women do factor in the hormonal component, but yeah. sometimes they'll be like, well, that's fine. Just leave my ovaries. And it's like, well, there's other things to consider. There's a reason we have those structures. They're supposed to be in there for many reasons. Yeah. But and then is incontinence usually related to after delivery or is there other reasons why people have incontinence? It's pretty, it's more common, I would say, after mm -hmm. having multiple babies, you don't necessarily like prolapse. There's actually mm -hmm. not a statistical correlation. I thought there was, that was part of why I researched it. Mm -hmm. um, like it's logical to think if you've had four babies, you're more likely to pee or have prolapse than if you've had one baby. Yeah. Not actually necessarily true. Okay. Um, having bigger babies, having difficult deliveries and having babies close together. Now that can play a role. Uh -huh. um, but we also see quite a bit, this kind of goes back to the Kegel thing a little bit. We actually see quite a bit of leaking in women with really tight stomachs or intestinal issues. Constipation is actually one of the leading causes of prolapse and heavily contributes to incontinence. Mm -hmm. um, so we do a lot of visceral work and abdominal work as well with clients because that's really common. I mean, IBS and bowel problems and poor mm -hmm. digestion, yikes, yeah. um, really, really common. So that actually plays an even bigger role in women that have had tummy detox or even cryotherapy can create abdominal tension and artificial pressure on the bladder. Again, back to some of the athletes we work with, it's things are literally so tight that the bladder's being squeezed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 
Yeah, it's sad because we're taught stand up straight, tall, suck your gut up and in, and we don't realize we're taking away space from the organs that are down there and they need to be able to expand and contract so it can be detrimental to the area. No. Is there any specific tips that you would give to women? Just like one or two tips. Is there anything common that you recommend or is it really someone needs to have that attention to their body specific to them? One thing that women could all, like all women, all people could benefit as a good Mm -hmm. starting point is to really learn to breathe well. Yeah. And to slow down a bit. It's part of why we built the yoga studio here. um, Mm -hmm. Just to slow down a bit, breathe well into your belly and pelvic floor. Take a minute to feel and listen to your body um, and, and trust yourself. I think so many things, not just women, but especially women to question every decision you make, especially as a parent, um, you know, breastfeeding, bottle feeding, diapers, cloth, like co-sleeping, not like there's just literally every type of questioning and self-doubt is really easy to creep in. And so to trust yourself when something a provider says doesn't sit well, to ask more questions and seek other information. I mean, Dr. Google is not necessarily everybody's friend either, um, but there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot more, um, thankfully, like resources that women have now to get other information, to find other answers. Um, And so just to trust yourself. And if something doesn't sit right with you or you aren't sure you want to try that medication or you aren't sure you want to try that diet or try that, definitely maybe you don't want surgery or just to trust yourself and seek other answers, seek other avenues. Um, So, yeah. Okay. This is great. Well, you've provided a ton of information. If people want to come see you, how do they get in touch with you? How do they have that discovery call? Yeah. So we're at momentoftruthpt.com. Okay. Our building is located over in Peoria in the West Northwest Valley of Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we have a YouTube channel. It's moment of truth, physical therapy. We have the website. We have lots of free reports and resources on the website too. And I promise we won't spam you. I think you get a total of four emails when you get a free report. And it's really just us, A, making sure you got the download and it worked. B, just checking in. Do you have any other questions or need anything? Um, That's pretty much it. But yeah, tons of resources on there. We are on Facebook and Instagram as well. I try to do a lot of educational content on there. We have a weekly wellness post that goes out um, on Wednesdays, Wellness Wednesdays. Um, So yeah, we try to provide a lot of resources and education too for people that might not be close to us or able to come in. We also have students almost year round um, that we're training and helping grow in that, that also help us run a pro bono clinic. We have massage here. We have a yoga studio and lots of workshops going on in the yoga studio. So really trying to be a resource and a valuable educational source here in the West Valley. Oh, this is great. Oh, I appreciate your time today. Thank you oh, thank for you. taking the time. Sorry and... for the tech glitches. Goodness, that never happens. <laughs> like, of course, we're on video and everything. It's totally fun. Ah. But <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have Amy come on. Please check out all of her educational tools. Please go see her if you need the help. And we'll see you again next week. Take care. Bye now.